Good afternoon and welcome to our latest session of Tehran Islamic Studies Monitor. Um, today we are going to talk about Marain Panputan's uh, recent article on the on the grace of God as evidence for a written Osmanic archetype, the importance of shared orthographic idiosyncrasies. Um, welcome. Uh, I'm really glad to have you, Marain, and Allah, Allah Vahid Mia, as discussant. Uh, many thanks for uh, joining, For uh, uh, and I'm delighted to have you here. Just, uh, just let me in introduce you, and then I will, uh, I will be at your service uh, to talk about the, the article. Uh, first, I think Ala uh, will will, uh, will give his will give her points about uh, the article, and then uh, we will be at your service, uh, Marine. Uh, well, um, um, Marine van Putten is, or I think was, a postdoctoral fellow in Leiden right. University Center for Linguistics. Um, he is specialized in the linguistic history of Arabic and Berber. He is currently focused on, or was, uh, that that is, he is currently focusing, focused on researching the linguistic feature of the Quranic consonantal text and its relationship to the Arabic, as reflected in the early Islamic papyri, papyri uh, and inscriptions, as well as transcriptions in non-Arabic scripts scripts such as Judeo-Arabic text and Greco and Copta Arabic transcriptions. Besides, uh, the, besides this, he continues to work on the reconstruction of the historical morphology of Proto-Berber. And Ola Vahid Nia, who is the discussant uh, of uh, this paper today, is an assistant professor in the Department of Quranic Studies at the Institute for Humanities and Cultural Studies in Tehran. She holds a PhD in Islamic studies from the University of Tehran, and her area of specialization includes the study of early Quranic manuscripts. So thank you both for uh, accepting my invitation to be here. I'm really glad to have you here. Um, the, the importance of this paper, I think, is that it introduces uh, as an, an innovative approach, other than the well-known ones, to assess the datings of the codification of the Quran, uh, Marain has done this by appealing to the spelling of the word ni'mat in, in, in the, uh, in, in the comp compounds of ni'matullah or ni'matul rabbik, uh, and whether it is written with ta or ta al-marbuta in 14, I think, manuscripts. Um, and, and, and this is very fascinating. And I will uh, let uh, Allah to, uh, to make an introduction of the article and make his, uh, her point about the uh, the the arguments of the article, and then uh, to Marine to give uh, his points. Uh, thank you, Allah, for uh, joining us, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mohsen, for having me, and uh, uh, thanks, Marine, for being with us. Uh, it's great to be together here. Okay, let's begin. Uh, as you all know, for at least uh, four decades. Uh, the study of the Quran has been characterized by a far-reaching lack of consensus on basic historio historiographical questions such as where and when uh, the Quranic corpus originated. And this paper, I mean uh, Dr. von Putten's paper, uh, takes a novel approach to this question, which is wonderful. Uh, he pointed out that uh, not only almost all early Quran manuscripts in terms of surah order, verse order, and even the specific wording belong to the same Osmanic text type, uh, but also, of course, there are some exceptions such as the Codex Sana 1 and another Codex from Sana, I think, uh, 01, 32, 1, and Mashar Codex as to the surah order, but also in terms of variant orthographic forms of certain words, almost all Quranic manuscripts followed specific patterns. And this shows that there must have been a single written archetype from which all Quranic manuscripts of the Uthmanic text type are descended. And also this indicates that from the very beginning of the text uh, standardization, every single manuscript that belongs to the Osmanic text type must have been copied from a written exemplar. 
Uh, Maria, you studied the two different spellings of the word anama, I mean, with prolonged and rounded ta in, in 14 manuscripts uh, as an example to show that uh, the or, uh, orthographic idiosyncrasies point to a single written archetype. The result that's shown in table two is amazing. Almost 13 manuscripts out of 14 follow a specific pattern, and this is great. But I would like uh, to add this comment here that uh, the earliest surviving books on Masahi photography, such as books by uh, Ibn Ammar al Mahdawi, Ibn Mu'adh al Juhani, Abu Amr al Dani, and so on, reveal that orthography was largely stabilized and, and the Masahi. Uh, or codexes or Quran, Quran codexes were orthographically largely consistent, although few original variants are also represented. Uh, for example, uh, writers of Masahif books in their treatment of uh, marking the feminine ta in, in forms like al-lana, al-sana, al-na'ma, al-kalima, etc. Uh, claim that uh, writing the forms with rounded or prolonged ta is largely regular in the masahif. For instance, in their treatment of the uh, of the form anama that you studied it, Al Dani and also Al Mahdawi report that uh, there exclusively exist eleven attestations of the form with a rounded ha. Under the chapter. Uh, entitled "Dikru ma rasma fi al-masahif min haat al-ta'nif bita ala al-asl aw murad al-wasl." It reads, uh, uh, "You can refer to the table two well, um, in the paper." وكل ما في كتاب الله عز وجل من ذكر النعمة فهو بالها إلا أحد عشر حرفا في البقرة 231. وفي آل عمران 103 وفي المائدة 11 وفي إبراهيم 28 وفيها أيضا 34 وفي النحل 72 83 114 وفي لقمان 31 وفي فاطر 3 وفي الطور 29 This account significantly corresponds to the results shown in the table 2 You can refer to the table 2 in the paper and verify the results Generally, by examining the early Quranic manuscripts, it can be seen that a large number of masahif or codexes uh, follow the same convention. However, variant instances are also numerous. As you mentioned later in your paper, when it comes to the plain or defective spellings of all, for example, there appears to be a fairly free variation of the two possibilities across Quranic manuscripts in certain environments. Okay. I would say that uh, it was a common practice to devote a detailed chapter to um, deletion or retention of medial alif in most half uh, orthography books, wherein the forms with deleted or preserved medial alif have been discussed. I'll give you an example. For example, Abu Amr al-Dani reports that all attestation of al-kitab or kitab, except for foreign stanzas, have been written without alif, um, in which the, the alif is marked, just, just for uh, instances. But uh, taking a glimpse at the same instances uh, attested in early manuscripts indicates that Kitab does not appear as such with medial alif. Everybody can check this in, in early manuscripts. So uh, I want to know your opinion on this, Marin, and what could be the reason, you think? Also, also, it is worth noting here that there were Muslim scholars who attended to this issue of orthographic irregularities. For instance, al farra in the late second century. Attending to instances of such irregularity says, uh, uh, by which he intends to say that the copists 
who wrote the earliest Masahif were not accustomed to following the same scribal conventions since their orthography left much to be desired. And this issue raised by al farra also corroborated by the earliest Quran manuscripts. Another point I want to make here is, uh, is that it is mentioned in the paper that um, there is an extremely strong correlation between the position of the idiosyncratic spellings in the Cairo edition and earlier Quranic manuscripts. I would like to add a comment on this. We may imagine by, by examining this in the, in the earlier codex and, and comparing with the uh, Cairo edition, we may imagine that the, the Cairo edition is uh, an intentional and successful return to form of the original rest. But I think, with all respect to your opinion, it is not. In fact, when the Al Azhar specialist convened to produce a reliable edition of the Quran towards 1920, they never thought of looking for the earliest written witnesses. Rather, they just rely on what sources like Al Muqna, by Abu Amr al Dani, say about the Masahif for us. Uh, even writing of Ibrahim without Ya in Surat al-Baqarah or for example Shay without Alif in all Mus'hafs except for uh, one instance in Surat al-Kahf وَلَا تَقُولَنَّا لِشَيْءٍ and so on is according to Al-Dani's reports I think but such claims are not corroborated whatsoever by early chronic manuscripts in which, for example, the orthographic form Shay appears as Shay everywhere. And uh, that's it. Marin, could you please share your thoughts with us about this? I would like to know your um, opinions on this. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... No, I mean these are all all excellent points. I, I um, um, let me see. Where shall I start? Um, so, well, let's let's first talk a little bit about the Cairo edition, actually. Um, okay. So it's tr true, of course, um, that that uh, the rasm that we see in in say the standard text uh, and all standard texts are not based on manuscripts were indeed, you know, based on, on these Masahif works, Rasan works, uh, whatever you like to call them. Um, and Al-Mukna clearly played an important role um, in how it is formed. And very often when we see something strange about, about, about uh, the Cairo edition compared to manuscripts we're used to, it's because it's in Al-Mukna and or some other works, but mostly there. And um, but I, I would say that, you know, looking, looking at these medieval works, they are, although they, they clearly get some things very wrong and strangely wrong, like the Shay uh, example that you mentioned, um, they also get a lot right. Uh, and, you know, they get, for example, the, the, the Na'matullah thing, right? And the Latnatullah and all these questions. And, um... It is it is it is a little mysterious. I, I think sometimes to to wonder how it got some of these things right and how it got some of these things wrong, and um, that must have something to do with 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 the sources that they were consulting, and that the kind of manuscripts that we are looking at, so the really ancient ones, were not necessarily the ones that say a Danny was looking at, uh, who was probably looking at slight later manuscripts, maybe, you know, manuscripts more typical for, for uh, Al-Andalus or, or the Maghreb at the time, uh, which may have had more advanced orthographies, these kinds of things. And so we, we kind of get this kind of a pretty good match to some extent, but to some extent we also get a mismatch, right? And and the mismatch is, is nowhere near as big as what we would find in, say, um, Ottoman manuscripts, which have completely classicized uh, spelling or even uh, the Ibn al-Bawab Quran, uh, beautiful, complete Quran, uh, 
uh, that is in the Chesabiti library, which is pretty early. It's it's uh, fourth century, so it's one one thousand CE, and that already has fully classicized spelling. This whole pattern of clearly reproducing the spellings is gone in in that manuscript. Um, so clearly, the, these works are are closer to to say the original Rasan than than some later manuscripts are. So so you know the Masahif works are closer to the Rasan than probably even a, a lot of manuscripts were at the time. Um, maybe not so much in 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 the Maghreb, but in in the Mashriq, I, I would say so. Um, so that's kind of an interesting question, and you know, as you pointed out, so, so the Nehmat spellings, these things show up in the works, right? And that's why uh, the Cairo edition gets it right. It's not because the Cairo edition looked at manuscripts, um, which kind of a strange choice, but at the same time, I think very uh, interesting. And I think it's 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 it speaks in favor of of these Masahif works that you get something that is pretty close in the end. Um, now, when it comes to the question of the Alif. Um, it's hard. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it's one of the things that I kind of threw up as a as a as a general <laughs> question in my paper, and I, I don't think my my thoughts have developed on it much more. I think I have a couple of ideas. Um, so clearly, when these works, these 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 masahid, uh, Rasan works, um, talk about the spelling of the alif that doesn't really seem to correspond very well with what we actually see in manuscripts. Some things it gets right, you know, like Al-Kitab is usually written without an alif. That's true. I mean, it's very hard to find manuscripts where it is written with an alif. Um, but they're very specific, you know, there's one exception thing. We don't see that. Uh, same with Shay. Um, well, it's the other way around. But uh, so you get these these odd uh, odd exceptions and odd rules that are formulated in these Masahif works, which, which well, don't show up in manuscripts. At the same time, um, some general rules do work out, right? So, um, like fa'ilun type uh, active participles um, in the plural and fa'ilats never have the alif in the first syllable, and that's mostly right. Um, in some later Kufic manuscripts, say third, fourth century, um, you do start seeing them there, but you don't see that in 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 the first century. And these descriptions basically get that right, which is surprising um, in some ways. Um, so, so there's clearly something there, there's clearly a system going on there, but at the same time, I mean, some of these elifs are just chaos. Um, so there are places, um, where you look at like, you know, is this word written with an elif or without an elif, and you just don't get a consistent answer between manuscripts. And I don't think it's possible so ideally, you'd want to find some kind of pattern there, right? You'd want to see, okay, maybe later manuscripts will always write this word with an elif, and earlier manuscripts never write this word with an elif, or all manuscripts from this production center use elifs in these words, and all manuscripts from this in, 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 use it in these words. And um, I think there are some patterns, uh, and and Derosh kind of hints at this in his work, um, especially his 2009 and 2014 art, uh, books, um, where he looks into the, you know the spelling of of uh, Abad and uh, Qala and these kinds of things, and generally notices that Abad tends to be written with an alif more in somewhat later manuscripts. Same thing with whether Qala is written Qaf uh, alif lam or just Qaf lam. Uh, so there seems to be a kind of a a um, temporal thing going on there, but sometimes you do find very early manuscripts that use alif, and then you go to later manuscripts and the alif is gone. So it, there's not a not an absolute um, directionality to this. There's a general trend, uh, but it's very dangerous to say, well, this word is written with an alif, therefore this manuscript must be later, right? And uh, and some alif start disappearing after a while, like in the early manuscripts, uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, you know, thu uh, would always be written as thel uh, wow alif. Yeah. Later on, they start writing it with thel wow, right? And the alif is gone. And that's what we see in the Cairo edition, the alif is gone. Um, so what do we do with that? Um, it's hard. Uh, so what I think, what I hope to find when, when I think, 
uh, the alifs are actually a very important key to better understanding the transmission history of the Quran, uh, at least I hope. Uh, but it's very difficult to research it. Um, so I would imagine that if we would really take all these manuscripts and start comparing them across each other, we will start seeing bundles of, okay, this group of manuscripts writes these words with an alif and these words without, and this group generally does it here, or this, they make an ex exception exactly this place, and they probably copy these kind of things pretty carefully as well. Um, but there was more variation across, um, say, say the Islamic worlds, how you did this and what the solutions were for that, and how free people felt to, to change those spellings, um, where they didn't feel it with others. And I think if we would have some kind of way to encode these manuscripts and um, compare, uh, you know, through more computer-based methods, actually compare, you know, hundreds of manuscripts and hundreds of spellings, there probably would be some kind of clustering going on. And we could say, okay, this LF use is typical for this group of manuscripts and this LF use is typical for this group of manuscripts. Um, and that would tell us a lot about, about say, the microstematics. We have a kind of general sense, you know, of manic archetype and then, then Assyrian Codex and the Basman Codex, Kufan and Medinan. Um, but I think the Elifs might hold a key to get a more higher resolution look at that. Um, but sadly, it is so much because, I mean, there are so many Elifs, there are so many Elifs missing um, in these manuscripts. I don't think it's easy to get an intuition for that by just looking at them. And I really think we need a computer to tell us what is going on there. So that's kind of my my thoughts on on what's going on with the elifs, um, and that's that's a bit more specific than I had at first. But it's it's a formidable task um, because to be able to answer this at all, we need to have good transcriptions of manuscripts in a computer readable format, mm -hmm. which is also translatable from one manuscript to the other. So, you know, it, we can't just have researchers do, do their own thing with these kinds of things. We need a standard format. This is how you transcribe a manuscript. And then you can start uh, comparing them with a computer. Um, but if they're all different and everybody does their own thing, it's not possible. And I'm just as guilty of doing that as everybody else. Um, but really to bring that forward, we, we want something else, right? We want some kind of standardized format so that we can, can start asking these questions. And then still, we need to transcribe hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts, which is a lot of work. So um, that's my thoughts on them. I think there's something there. I think there should be something doable with these elves. Maybe it turns out it's completely random and we can't find anything. Um, but I'd, I'd like for that to not be true. Um, those are my thoughts, at least my initial thoughts. I'm happy to uh, uh, discuss further if you have any ideas or thoughts on this. Uh, Maureen, I think uh, this is not just uh, the the problem with Alif. Uh, mm. Further attestations, in, for example, include as sana uh, for mm -hmm. example, uh, Alana. Mm -hmm. um, we we can easily find many many instances that invalidated this this uh, system this pattern in early manuscripts. Hmm. Um, what do you think about them? So, 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 so you think because hmm, I'm not sure. Um, so I've looked at, at a couple of these, of course. It's not just Ni'matullah, um, but it's also Latnatullah, Rahmatullah. I know I've looked at Rahmatullah, and there the pattern is very clear. And of course, you find occasional exceptions here and there in in early manuscripts. Uh, just like, you know, even for Ni'matullah, uh, at least one of them um, clearly forms an exception, at least to what is reported. Yeah. But I think in general, um, these manuscripts agree with each other to to a really surprising extent. Um, in, my, okay. in my case in the Quran article that I wrote together with Philip Stokes, um, I also had, you know, Jaza'uhu, and whether and Jaza'uhum, Mm -hmm. And whether that's written with alif wow and then ha or just alif and, and ha. And that's a pattern that we don't find in the Cairo edition at all. Um, but there is clearly a pattern there in early manuscripts. I looked at like eight, I think, at the time. 
uh, compare them across each other. And even there, you see these kinds mm -hmm. of, you know, clearly somehow correlated spellings, uh, which do not get recorded by the tradition, uh, but do clearly get copied very carefully uh, in these early manuscripts. So I think I think the Aleph is is a more um, I mean, depends because with some Aleph's it's not it's just as stable as it is with this kind of stuff. Uh, but I think it really is quite um, quite distinct. And um, of course, I mean, I haven't been able to look at every manuscript ever, uh, but um, I've looked at quite a lot uh, for for a bunch of these and. I'm always struck by how few exceptions you find, at least in, in the early, early manuscripts um, that completely falls apart in later stuff. So I mentioned the Ibn al-Bawab Quran. Um, that just always writes, Ni'matullah, it always writes it with Tama Buta, uh, with one exception. Uh, but other than that, it's just the, the pattern is gone, right? So there, you wouldn't be able to tell whether it was copied from an example or it was just copied from memory because it's just, the spelling won't tell you. Um, so that's that's kind of my thinking on that. Um, do you think? Do you see that differently? Uh, yeah, I, I say that. Uh, hello. Yeah, we we have your voice. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Can you still hear us? Hello, can you hear us? Oh, well. Seems we missed. I'll, I'll, I'll check yeah. with him. Uh, let, let's see if there is... Hello? Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear us? Okay. Um, uh, Maureen, can, can, you, uh, can you repeat your question? I, excuse me, I... Sure. I didn't... So... Um, so I, I mean, I, I don't quite know uh, how much you've heard of what I said just now, but uh, what I what I was trying to say is, I, I think, um, I mean, of course, you find occasional exceptions with these kind of things like Lanatullah and, 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 and Rahmatullah, just like you find some exceptions with Namatullah. But in general, I think the pattern for these is very stable across early manuscripts um quite different yeah from yeah I, I agree with you i agree with yeah. you it can be seen mm -hmm. that a large number of masahi follow the same convention mm -hmm. it's obvious yeah. but however variant instances are also mm -hmm. numerous there are, there are many many variant instances that are not follow this uh this pattern mm -hmm. but i so uh, do, you, do you have any 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 um, i don't have any idea about the reason <laughs> No. So, so what? What about? Um, so, are these are these specific manuscripts you've looked at that seem to not follow these patterns, or um, because, of course, it, it also just depends on um, the kind of corpus that we have access to. And um, I I cannot say I've been able to look at many of the Iranian manuscripts. So, uh, it would be very interesting to hear if that's if it's different there, which would be very surprising to me, but very cool to hear, of course. Uh, right now, I, I I can't remember the, the mm. instances, the exact instances, mm. but um, later we can discuss on this. Uh, sure, I'd be very happy to. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Ola, if you have any further reflections. No, I, I don't have anything. Oh. Uh, just what we're discussing at a paper, it, it went uh, short uh, relatively to our previous sessions, and it's mm. good news. <laughs> and so uh, we, we can now turn to the audience if they have any questions. If you want me to enable your voice, please let me know. 
And if you want to read me your question, please write it, write it down on, on the chat. Mm -hmm. If there's any other questions. Uh, there are someone who uh, seems to be uh, dealing with the debate. I think maybe uh, Professor Heysam Sadri, if I'm right, or Muhammad. Yeah. 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 Heysam, uh, I. Can can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Hi. <laughs> all, right, all right. Well, you, you said my name. I'll, I'll chime in. So I, I think we should distinguish between two things. Uh, so first of all, great discussion. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, I think we should distinguish between why, uh, which is why we see a, uh, some words that follow a strong pattern and other ones that don't, mm -hmm. uh, and what. Uh, as in what that means. So right. I, I think the what part is pretty clear. So even mm. if there are other words that don't fit this pattern, uh, it does not invalidate the no. fact that uh, a pattern like Ni'matullah or Rahmatullah or Jazauhu or anything, the only explanation for that pattern uh, is a, a very judicious uh, written transmission. Uh, even if mm. other words are completely uh, uh, mixed up, and so, so what we have to establish, I think, so moving forward, uh, is try to answer the why. Uh, why were some words, uh, why did the scribes feel that some words were, were I'm, I use the word sacred, or very important to mm -hmm. copy very faithfully, uh, and other words were not? And, and I think maybe one direction along which one might start thinking is uh, spellings that actually did have an impact uh, mm -hmm. on, on pronunciation uh, are actually the ones potentially that got changed. So Elif, mm -hmm. you know, the, the medial Elif is very important uh, in distinguishing between the way you read things. Uh, and a scribe might have a, might be opinionated, might have a strong opinion uh, about that and therefore be interested or willing to change that. On the other hand, whether Ni'mat Allah is spelled with a ta marbuta or, or with a ha or a ta, that doesn't affect how you're going to read Ni'mat Allah. Because everybody mm -hmm. knows that ta marbuta in context is read as ta, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, therefore that spelling is maintained. I, this is just a hypothesis, but I think the why we need to explore uh, yes. a little bit more deeply and separate that out from the question of, of the observation, which is very clear. Yeah. That's a very interesting suggestion. I, I hadn't quite thought of it like that, but it, but that's that's... That's an interesting point. Um, let me think about this for a second. It'd be nice if we could try to find other examples that are kind of similar to um, the 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 elif that doesn't involve elifs. So what, what I'm curious about, I'm kind of curious. Um, although, have you shut down your your uh, microphone again? Well, we'll see. Um, yeah. So that's an interesting thing. Um, that's true. So, so of course, leaving out the alif can can give a lot of ambiguities. That that writing the how the tower tamabuta and tamaftuha, if we want to call them that, um, don't give. And um, but at the same time, you know, there's some places where where it would be nice to have the alifs, where where they're still not written or or still very. I don't know. Um, Maybe it's not it's not that not that obvious, but hmm. so say the feminine ending, right? So the feminine ending, the feminine plural ending, I should say, at is almost always written without elif, with the exception of say jannat, banat, and a couple of other words that are only three consonants long. Um, and you'd expect that to be just as attractive to start writing with an elif, and it starts happening at some point in later manuscripts, but it's. It remains pretty irregular, um, but it's true. Distinguishing the why is important here, and I think I think how how likely you are to read it wrong might be a good reason why people might be changing the spellings, uh, and that kind of feeds into the shape and uh, mi'ah as well, right? Where you see this even today that people end up 
reading Mia written with Elif Ya as Maya, which is wrong, of course. Um, and Shay, I guess you could start writing it as Shay, reading it as Shay or something like that. So I see how that might play a role, yeah, definitely. Interesting. Well, uh... or the first like salat with alif uh, or with wa mm -hmm. is salut yeah. or salat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting one as well because that pretty early on already um, you start seeing variation in that, and I I would still say that there's some pattern there I think, but I haven't looked too closely at that. Um, uh, but but very early on, I mean, already in Arab three three one, uh, we see manat being written with an alif rather than with wow. Um, no, yeah, no, that's true. That that comes along pretty early. Uh, so that's another example where where you know it at least potentially is pretty ambiguous how you're supposed to pronounce it. Um, and maybe there you're more free to change the spelling or something like that. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, hey, Sam, if you'd like to say another thing, uh, and uh, Ali, I wonder if you want to add something to this or you have another question. Hi, everybody. Hey, how are you doing? Hi. Yes, Hi. you're a bit soft, but... Uh, you hear me? Yeah, 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 we yes, have you. a bit soft, but I can hear you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. It was a fascinating talk. And thank you, Haytham, uh, for um, adding your point. And I'm going to, to continue the same direction of why and what uh, distinction. Um, I think the, um, we can also consider the, uh, the change of conventions during the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the... the, uh, the uh, um, addition of alephs is also part of the uh, change of conventions. So it's not only for because of, of the, um, uh, the change of in the meaning, uh, it could be, mm. but uh, mm. there is a point of change of convention. Then you, when we come to the later manuscript, you see that there, there are many alephs there. And it yeah, is not yeah, for sure. only because of the meaning. It's uh, it, the convention of uh, writing is completely changed. So people very uh, easily uh, change the, uh, the way of writing without uh, having any, uh, they, they were not afraid of for change. But yeah. for many, many other cases, there's, there's still uh, stay with the previous conventions. So this is mm -hmm. also a point of view. So for, for Alephs, I think we have uh, we have to consider this point of view. I I'm just because my main concentration is on uh, late Kufic manuscripts. So mm -hmm. in, in these manuscripts, you see, I mean, uh, uh, Al Mogne does not work here because uh, yeah. Al Mogne yeah. uses another corpus. It's it's, right. uh, yeah. it's different. And we also the the point about Mogne uh, and uh, people like Dani um, is. I think they have access to a kind of middle part of the corpus. So they didn't mm -hmm. have access to the early manuscript. And you see yeah. that they, there is no uh, description of early manuscripts because they have not seen this. But yeah. they, they describe the manuscript that they have seen. And the later Kufic manuscripts are not their points also. It's, it's uh, too late for them. So yeah. We have to consider also this. And uh, one more point I'm going to add here about what uh, Marain suggested. Uh, actually, we, in my project, Iran Quran, we have started to, mm -hmm. to establish a, a, a database to mm -hmm. uh, transcribe. I mean, it's a kind of complementation of the Corpus Quranicum project. Mm -hmm. And we are going to uh, digitize all uh, um, early manuscripts and also later Kufic manuscripts in a very, uh, in a very uh, standard um, machine uh, um, readable um, way. So uh, hopefully in, in, uh, in the f uh, following months, we get the first results of a kind of 
machine uh, comparisons, not only by hand and looking at the right. manuscript, but also uh, a way of comparison. As, as, as you know, in the Corpus Chronicum, we have a, a huge corpus of early manuscripts, many of them mm -hmm. are transcribed, but not systematically. And mm -hmm. we are going to change to a new system that uh, uh, makes, makes it uh, more uh, possible to do uh, computer-based analysis. And I want to add, also we, are, we, are, we, are, uh, we appreciate any collaboration in this regard, because as my said, it's a lot of work. We, uh, transcription of manuscripts is, uh, is a huge stuff, but we have uh, already prepared a very nice tool, uh, easy, user-friendly tool for Beautiful. transcription. And it's not only for transcription, because in the manuscript, we have different layers. and. Uh, Marain also has done a lot in this direction that we have different layers and we can also look at the uh, kind of dating of, of uh, different layers of manuscript. We have a spelling or uh, orthography. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, um, dots, which has another, which is a later or another layer and has another meaning also in it, a variant mm -hmm. meaning. And then no. uh, you, in, in a later point, also you get some more additional uh, corrections, additions, uh, I don't know, this kind of variations in the manuscript. We are going to submit all of these different layers in our system. So That's it's great. not only a comparison in the first layer, I mean, the Corpus Chronicum was based only on the translation system. But we are, we are developing this not only to uh, not only uh, covering the trans transcription, but also we cover variant readings, verse separation, mm -hmm. everything. So it's kind of complete set of computer-based uh, data. Mm -hmm. Great. No, that's very exciting. Um, one one thing I'm, I'm I'm really looking forward to that. So please chats soon and uh, see uh, what we can do and these kinds of things um one thing i wanted to kind of jump jump off from 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 your point um of course that that yeah there, there's something going on um with these with these later kufic manuscripts in terms of orthography and clearly i clearly there are patterns there right there there the clearly there's there's clearly a move towards using more elifs and really elifs even in places where um, looking at it from older manuscripts, you can be very surprised. Like it, it, I've seen a couple of times already that uh, Malaika is written with with Lam Elif, which you would never see in an early manuscript. That's such a that's such a typical typical late thing. And there's a couple of things there which, which are kind of interesting. Something I noticed is that um, these later Kufic manuscripts um, will use. Um, writing elifs in places where you normally wouldn't in order to make a graphemic word end so if it's at the end of the at the end of the line but there's not enough room to write malaika anymore they'll write mala and then write it with lam elif right and then continue on the next line to to write ika and um so so they seem to be playing with the possibility to use the elif for layout purposes um, which is certainly not something that is happening in these early manuscripts, but in these in these later manuscripts where there's also less space because um, you know it's just the writing of especially Kufic these uh, manuscripts is just huge. Um, they they seem to really be using say the elif for that. Uh, that is something I have not really um, looked at systematically. It's just something I noticed when looking at the, these later manuscripts that that is really a thing that is going on. So that's a kind of changing convention and kind of really, uh, it's a very nice why, you know, you can explain why is this work written with, with an extra elif because it was at the end of the line and they needed to start with a new thing. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, whether that observation really holds up, uh, we'll have to see, but, but that, that, that was my. And the Quran of Amajur, which is, of examples of this happening so that was fun well uh, uh, there is uh, another question oh, okay. oh, sorry sure so, sorry if no you problem. want to 
if you go, go go ahead. No, it's fine. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, um, so I'll, I'll finish it very quickly. But um, so so you know, kaf alif lam as the conventional spelling for qala and sort of kaf uh, lam. That's clearly a later thing, and that becomes basically conventional at some point. It'd be interesting to see where does that transition take place. Um, oh, subscription to media field. Please leave the room and join again. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and re-log in. I'm not sure if you guys can hear me. Yeah, um, okay. I, I can hear you. I can okay. hear you. Yeah, you're just fine. Okay. Uh, we, we had a lag, uh, but, but, yeah, but yeah. it's okay. fine now. Great. Um, th so, there is a... Um, oh, so. yeah, please. You go, go ahead, go ahead. If, no, if, no, I, I was oh, just, okay. just going to say, I okay. thought there was another question. Yeah, yeah. There, there's another question in chat. Mohammad Gandhari has asked uh, after thank you, uh, thank you, Marain and Allah. Uh, I had a general question: Is it possible to establish something like a stematology of Quran based on these kind of orthographic idiosyncrasies of the early manuscripts? Um. Yes. No. Yes. Um. So we we can get a a, a stema, um, of the Quran. Uh. Michael Cook wrote a really amazing article on this, which is more about about um, differences in the rasm um, across, um, well, that are described in these works. And you know, say you know, the, the manuscripts of Syria have this, the manuscripts of Kufa have this, and those form a very nice stemma. And these variants that are reported show up in manuscripts quite consistently, which is something that um, Haitham has worked on and showed very nicely that it shows up very consistently in the manuscripts, which is exciting. Um, when it comes to these smaller idiosyncrasies, the kinds I'm, I'm looking at right now uh, for this article, basically, I've tried to find something. So sometimes you see one of these variants is a bit more chaotic than others. Um, so for Netmatullah, we find that um, there's serious disagreements in Surah 37, Ayah 57, um, and I wondered, okay, is it maybe that the Syrian manuscripts have one spelling and the Boston spellings have another? Um, and I couldn't find anything like that. My hope and my expectation is that, yes, given enough data, you might be able to get some schematics out of this, um, but that's more data than, than my, my human pea brain can process at the same time. Um, so it's something I'd want computers to do for me, uh, but I hope so. I hope um, we can get more specific schematics out of it. That, that would be that would be, I think, the end goal for these kinds of studies. Yeah. Uh, great, thanks. Great. Um, so if if you let me if you let me know if there is another question here. <coughs> Oh, the article uh, is just the article that we're discussing here. The grace of God as evidence for a mm -hmm. written Othmanic archetype, the importance of shared orthographic idiosyncrasies. It's um, free to download, which is great. It's, it's open access. So um, it's in the Bulletin for the School of Oriental and African Studies. Yes, I think uh, just uh, Haitham, your hand is raised. I, I, is there any, is there something else you want to Cool. Oh, uh, nope, that's, uh, sorry about that. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, um, well that, that's good. Um, could you please let me know, uh, oh, the, the title. Yeah, the title. So if, if there is any other question, if there is not any question, we can uh, bring it to a close. It is uh, quite short in comparison to my our previous sessions, but very interesting, uh, very precise and dense uh, um, discussion. And I really enjoyed it. If, if you want to put something else, uh, Marine, to further uh, say something about your article or say something more general about the article and how did you get to write this or stuff like that I will be at your sure. service no I, I can I can I can do a little bit on that if, if, if that's interesting um, so I, I I was I was I was um, so the reason why I started working on this article is because I noticed 
you know, I, I come at this, I'm, I'm, I'm a linguist by training and a historical linguist by training, and I'm pretty used to, um, you know, these questions of, of say, critical editions and, and text criticism um, that kind of come part and parcel with these kinds of questions. And it really struck me that discussions even about the canonization of the Quran were not based on, on material evidence, which I just found very strange. So, so you know, if you look at one sprawl in 1977, but the same with Burton, um, they, they basically come up with these really radical ideas which, which just don't work with the manuscripts around. And and even as late as the 2000s, so Motsky looked at this, you know, the canonization of the Quran and he just dismisses the manuscripts for reasons that I don't find completely convincing, but nevertheless, he says, you know, we can't do anything about that. And and then again, you know, I think I think um, uh, uh, Cook made very good observations in 2004 about this. But once again, manuscripts just weren't discussed, and it just it just blew my mind because I had been looking at these manuscripts, and to me, it was very obvious that all these manuscripts had to have some kind of written archetype and a very early one, and. And I was like, well, nobody's written that, and people keep on arguing about about you know the canonization, pretending like these manuscripts don't exist. I, I think we should pretend like they exist because they do. Um, so that I wrote it, and I almost ended up not writing it because I thought it was very obvious. But people kept on telling me, no, no, it's not obvious to everyone. Please, you know, write this article. Um, so that's why I did. And but it's but it's it's a very strange situation, and I think the situation in part comes from you know the bad accessibility of these manuscripts, but also in part because the text is so stable. Um, I think many of these things that are being mentioned here were actually pretty obvious to, to, to the early Orientalists, so Nuldek, Ashwali, these kinds of things. Um, and be, because they did look at these manuscripts and, and they just didn't see a need to challenge this because it was obvious to them um, because back in those days, you know, being an Orientalist, this was part of the training. And then kind of as Islamic studies progressed, um, the focus on these manuscripts became less to the point that people kind of forgot why we accepted them to be one archetype. And and then you get, you know, this kind of hyper-skeptical uh, period with one sprawl. Um, and, and and others, of course, Cook as well, although, you know, he, he changed his mind uh, somewhat, when it, at least when it comes to this. Um, and, and Chrono, of course. And um, so, so this kind of this kind of materiality and actually using manuscripts and kind of looking at, at where things are, um, just just kind of fell out of favor. And I think that that's in part because a lot of things we do with with you know Islamic studies more broadly. Uh, although they work with manuscripts, they're hardly ever autographs, right? We hardly ever have the manuscript written by that person. And it becomes so typical to just kind of think in those senses that 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 this, that the the people kind of lost sight of the manuscript thing. But of course, I mean, it's also just, you know, they weren't as easily available. And I was in a very special position with, you know, the Corpus Quranicum project really kicking off around the time that I started working on this. Um, you know, if I had it been a couple of years earlier, my, my research would have probably looked very different. Um, so, yeah, so that that's kind of that's kind of how I how I looked and went about it. Um, and I needed it because I wanted to say something about the language of the Quran and I wanted to be able to say, well, this object, the Quran as a manuscript, is a thing that I can talk about. Um, and if people don't agree that that's a thing I can talk about, they're like, well, we don't know when it was written or whatever. Um, I felt like, well, then, then I'm not doing anything with the with the corpus that people will accept as a corpus. Um, so that was just purely my own kind of um, selfish reason why I started looking at this, and I started enjoying it a lot. So that's why I've been working a lot with manuscripts, just more generally. Um, but that that's kind of how that how this idea started for this uh, article. Yeah, re really interesting. Really interesting. Thank you. Uh, well, any any other questions? Is there any other questions? Uh, Ali has said that perhaps because it needs a lot of patience to work with manuscripts. When when you talked about uh, the previous mm. studies, yeah, so maybe. I mean, it's true, of course. Uh, well. It does, but, but I mean, it takes less and less patience as um, 
websites become more and more available, uh, this yeah. kind of work would have been much, much harder if I had to physically examine all these manuscripts and travel all over the world. Um, but now it's yeah. just, you know, it's a couple of clicks away and mm -hmm. still a lot of work, but it's, it's a very different kind of lot of work than it used to be, for sure. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Ola, if you have any further reflections or any final point, no, thank you. It has been a truly inspiring day for me. Thank you, Maureen, for your comments. Thank you, thank you. It's so good to hear from you again. So, the, thank, so you. thank you, Allah. Thank you, Maran, for joining us. It was very interesting discussion, uh, at least for me. Um, and uh, this was the last session of the first round of Tehranism. I hope you enjoyed all of these. Uh, and I hope we can start another one, uh, another round in the near future. And uh, if you have not any further reflections, we can bring it to a close and say bye. Okay. All right. Thank Anything. you. Thank you so much for having me. It was great. It was very. It, it was very pleasure. Good. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. bye, -bye.